Well, I'd like to start by thanking the event organizers for having me here. Um, it's quite a treat for me to be back in Thailand. Uh, Thailand's actually where I started my international career um, as a fifth grade homeroom teacher. That's Pratom Ha. And the town of Klang, I was teaching at Klang Witya Satawarn High School. Um, it was uh, <laughs> the tech guys were first, I'm the education guy. <laughs> as I said, I started as a fifth grade homeroom teacher um, at Klang Witya Satorn School, where we had very few projectors or any of this nonsense. <laughs> um, and as I'm sure many of you know, Klang is quite famous for being the birthplace of the royal Thai poet Sutan Pu. And Sutan Pu captured um, really the importance of education um, and is writing that with knowledge, you can stand on your own two feet. And while this is certainly true and important today, there's an addition that we need students who can not only stand on their own two feet, but who are prepared to take an active role in building the culture of peace that the world so sorely needs. Now, how do we do this? Well, to start, we have to take a new, uh, new look at a very old question. And that is, what does it mean to be educated? Uh, for those of us who are teachers, who are instructors, who are parents, who are involved with preparing youth, what are we trying to do? Is it literacy and numeracy? If you can read and write and do a little basic mathematics, are you prepared? Is that enough? What about Latin and Shakespeare? If you know the meaning and derivation of et tu brute, if you have received that classical liberal arts education, is that sufficient to understand the range of perspectives on what it means to be a human? Now, critical thinking skills get a lot of press in the modern world, and rightfully so. The ability to identify, to filter, to analyze, to problem solve. These are quite important, but are they enough? <laughs> I skipped one, I think. But there's also the idea of digital literacy, which has become quite important in our modern age. <laughs> that countries you see around the world are scrambling to set up ICT and education master plans. And teachers are working overtime to make sure their students are able to both use and develop new technologies. And this is important. All of these things are key. But are they enough to be prepared for the world? And are they enough to prepare students to have the skills and dispositions to build that culture of peace that the world needs? Well, there's a new trend <laughs> that we see the real rise of education for global citizenship. Now, it's important to note that global citizenship is not actually a new idea. Uh, the Greek philosopher Socrates was quoted by Plutarch as saying, I am neither Athenian nor a Greek, but a citizen of the world. Albert Einstein um, re thought that nationalism was the measles of mankind, a disease that must be eradicated. But in our modern age, what does it mean? What is this concept of global citizenship? Now, there's a lot of academics and a lot of blowhards <laughs> who pontificate on this subject, who give out a lot of frameworks and a lot of articles. And there's a lot of factors from second language acquisition to the development of empathy that are quite important. Uh, three I'd like to highlight that are common across all definitions of global citizenship. The ability to see yourself as connected to the world. The ability to collaborate with people from different cultural backgrounds, and the ability to comprehend and take action to shape the forces of globalization. Now, how are we doing as educators? Um, I'll talk about America, I, I guess because I'm an American. <laughs> uh, the 
global education organization World Savvy uh, conducted research on a sample of representative Americans aged 18 to 24. Uh, this was published in August of 2012. And they found that if you talk to 100 Americans, 100 young adults, only 52 would say that their education helped them to understand global issues that affected their lives today. Less than half would say that they were comfortable interacting with people of different cultural backgrounds. Only 37 would say that they understood different cultures. And only 29 would say that they understood the forces that shaped the global economy. Now what's particularly worrisome about this is that these young adults saw the importance of developing these skills. They knew that these were the skills they needed to succeed in the world. However, the school environment that they were coming from was not providing them those skills. And that's a real challenge. That's a true gap to be filled. So what is needed? How can we fix this problem? Well, as Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice. And broad, wholesome, charitable views of mankind cannot be acquired by vegetating in one's own little corner of the world. So we can begin with the premise that travel experiences outside of the classroom are necessary, are essential to building that skill set and mindset for global citizenship. However, <laughs> we must temper this premise um, with this quote from a real hero of mine, the educational philosopher John Dewey. Um, and as he notes, not all experiences are genuinely or equally educative. And this is a real um, factor that must be considered. Hmm. And when assessing the state of experiential learning and educational travel today, uh, two things become quite clear. One thing that we have and one thing that we need. We have REM. We need CIA. And my very liberal father has just disowned me for saying that. <laughs> Family. <laughs> REM is retention, engagement, and mentoring, mentorship. When we take students uh, snorkeling with sea lions and sharks in the Galapagos Islands. You can guarantee they're going to remember it. You can be sure they're going to be engaged and fully aware and fully involved with the world around them. And they will also be open and receptive to guidance and mentorship from their instructors. Now, let's step back a second and realize just how great this is. As for classroom teachers, and I did begin my career, as I said, as a classroom teacher, REM, retention, engagement, mentoring, are what you fight so hard to get every day. And with travel experiences, they come almost automatically. However, REM is not enough to make these educational. For that, we need CIA, curriculum, intentionality, and assessment. For curriculum, there must be a comprehensive and linked set of outcome-based lessons that span not just the travel itself, but the months before the travel, where students are prepared by gaining deep knowledge into the history and socio-political context of the destinations to which they are traveling, that they are facilitated to identify research topics of global significance that they can then research in the countries and produce meaningful outputs upon returning home. Underlying this curriculum is the idea of intentionality. And intentionality means quite simply that every activity, every experience, everything you do in the travel is set to fulfill an important goal. If that goal is developing global competency, uh, we can start with the definition here, which is taken from the Project on Global Leadership, which is a conglomeration of educational organizations led by the Asia Society. And their definition of global competency is quite simple. The capacity and disposition to understand and act on issues of global significance. And that's our end goal. 
That's what we're shooting for. And we can see four skill domains that will help us build to that. These are environmental awareness, the ability to, I should say, the understanding of the duty to act responsibly towards nature and to interact responsibly with the environment around us. Positive youth development, the ability and the perspective of youth to be an agent of change in the world, to feel that they have an internal locus of control and are able to take action to make the world a better place. Enriched learning, this is both the understanding of the processes by which we learn, both inside and outside of the classroom, as well as the motivation to learn. And finally, social and cultural awareness, the empathy and respect for people of wildly different cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds. And that's it. That's the full scope of uh, global competency. And this is a high standard. This is not easy. And because it's such a high standard, it's why this final point, assessment, becomes so critical. If you're an educational organization, if you're an educator, and you're setting a lofty goal, you have a duty to show your stakeholders, to show your families, to show the parents, to show your students, to show your community, to show the teachers, that you are meeting those goals. For experiential learning, we can look at assessments in self-reports of skill gains, focused observations of students during the experience, and the careful evaluation of the meaningful outputs they produce. And this is the way that we can prove to all those stakeholders out there that we are fulfilling our intentions and developing globally competent students. So that's what we need to do. Um, and I just want to conclude by talking about why it's so important to get this right, to do this right. And that's because in the world we live in today, our economic disparities are mirrored by digital divides. And this means that even in a world where we are closer together, both temporally and geographically, than ever before at any point in human history, there is still an inherent gap in our ability to really understand each other and to really connect with each other and appreciate our common humanity. Now, we can change this dynamic. We can fix this. To do this, our view of education must stretch beyond the classroom door. We must prepare youth to embrace new situations, to respond to the unfamiliar with empathy and respect, and to be ambassadors of peace. To be brief, we must prepare youth for the world. Thank you.